Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Navarro Betancourt, and I am the scientific director of Quadroscope, a venture capital fund that invests in early stage companies that aim to reverse aging or enhance health by targeting the mechanisms of aging. And today, I had the pleasure of talking with Dr. Hans Kirsted, who is the chairman of one of our portfolio companies called Immunis. So we talked about what they are doing. And Hans is a stem cell expert and a serial entrepreneur. He actually has founded four successful biotechnology companies and has led therapy development for, for multiple diseases, including cancer, spinal cord injury, immune disorder, retinal disease, and COVID-19. He is a, a former professor of anatomy and neurobiology at the University of California, Irvine, where he co-founded a multi-million dollar stem cell research center. And he was also involved in the creation of the $8.5 billion stem cell fund of the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. So without further ado, this is my conversation with Dr. Hans Kirsten. Thank you, Hans, for, for, um, for being here with us. A uh, real, real pleasure. Thank you. So why don't we start by, 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 um, by, by a quick introduction of, of Immunis. What, what is Immunis? Immunis is really the result of my, my career's work and the, the, really the careers of all of the founding members of Immunis in that we have been longtime stem cell experts, the, the group of us, mm -hmm. and realized over you know, decades that every manifestation of aging mm -hmm. occurs through the immune system. It, it results in an immune decline, age does. And so Immunis is really meant to target immunodecline with an immunomodulant that we discovered. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very unique biologic you know, really the first of its kind in the world. And that class of biologic has only recently been permitted by the FDA to be uh, approved and used and regulated in humans. So it's a new biologic, a new uh, style of drug regulated by the FDA. And it's one that just has tremendous immunomodulatory effects. And the idea is that Immunis provides a treatment for immunological disorders, but as aging is basically a result of an immuno decline by keeping that immune system prophylactically in health, then you basically stave off many of the manifestations of aging. Can, can we begin a little bit into that? Uh, what happens to the immune system in, in older persons? Well, when you're 27 years old, you birth your immune system from your bone marrow around every two weeks. So every two weeks, you're getting a completely regenerated, fresh immune system. Now, it's certainly true that you have memory cells that last longer than two weeks, remembering the bugs you encountered throughout your life. But the vast bulk of your immune system when you're 27 is, is replenished every 14 days. And what that does is that it, of course, replaces the old cells. But also, during the young stages, when those new immune system cells are born, think of them like teenagers, they're young and every human cell population when it's young secretes. They produce what's called a secretome, the sum of every single thing that they release. And these are growth factors, cytokines, chemokines, things that repair DNA. They cause the development and health of the organ to which they're specific. So in this case, what we've done is take human clinically approved government NIH approved stem cells, mm -hmm. laboratory generated, and then made them into the precursors that secrete all of the immune system modulators that you normally have plenty of when you're 27. Now, as you age, the frequency at which you birth your immune system declines precipitously. So you're not making your immune system every 14 days, but rather every year or more. And therefore your cells are old and tired. They get beat up. They're replicating very, very fast, these immune system cells in you. And therefore they accumulate genetic error. 
and they can't get replaced. And what's equally important is that they are no longer bathed, surrounded by these nursing factors, this secretome that their young progenitors make. Because you're birthing your immune system less frequently, you have fewer young cells that are secretory. So the old cells in an older person are, you know, they're old and tired and they've got no help. They've got no nursing help. They don't have any factors to fix their DNA, make them young, help them migrate, help them divide, help them normalize. So what happens as you age is you get a, you get an angry immune system. It doesn't grow quiet and still. It actually grows autoimmune. It starts like graying the lines between self and non-self. Mm -hmm. And with age, every human gets attacked by their own immune system. It's very much akin to COVID-19, actually. You know, if you die of COVID-19, you die not because of the bug, but rather because your own immune system is attacking you. The immune system can't recognize the bug, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2. And so it gets angry and it's hyper and it starts releasing pro inflammatory factors, dozens and dozens of them that drives the rest of your immune system into a, a state of hyper awareness, hyper vigilance as it's looking for the beast that's causing it harm, but it never finds it. And it, the, you know, the deleterious effects of an overactive uncontrolled immune system are as bad as death and less than that autoimmunity, less than that advanced aging, it's all bad. Mm -hmm. So immunis is really creating an immunomodulatory. It's very interesting that this, you know, this, this drug is a secretome and it's, it's worth just spending just a moment on that. Mm -hmm. Our entire drug system, the, the regulatory agency of every country like ours, the FDA here in the United States, every country has their own regulatory FDA, if you will. And they have all been built on a model of single active ingredients because they're easy and they work. Every drug you've ever taken has gone through this type of rigorous FDA oversight and you can control. Like if you take that active out of the treatment, you fail to see the effect. If you put it back in, you see the effect again. Very easy to experiment with. It was only recently, about five years ago, that regulatory bodies throughout the world created a new class of drug, the secretome, <laughs> consisting of hundreds of factors. And in our case, the natural secretory set that is immunomodulatory. And for an, for a, for an organ like the immune system, it's really scientifically, theoretically, and practically what we've seen in the past is that it's hard to regulate this extremely complex organ, your immune system, with one single active. Mm -hmm. Our immune system is hundreds of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory things. And they exist in this very dynamic balance. Think of an orchestra mm -hmm. with perhaps 200 musicians in there. And sometimes the horns are loud and sometimes the strings are loud. Sometimes the percussion's loud. It's just a, an incredible control system. And think about that when it goes wrong. It's cacophony and you don't want to listen to that symphony. <laughs> That's your immune system with age. So, so let, let's talk a bit more about the secretum. Is, is, is this only proteins? What, what, what are the components of, of the secretum? Do you have, a, for example, um, uh, extracellular vesicles in the secretome or um, nucleic acids, uh, mm -hmm. RNA. Yeah. yeah, we have basically all of those things, everything that is secreted by the young cell type. So now this is where it's very important to realize what you're getting your secretome from. Mm -hmm. It is indeed everything that's released by these young human progenitor cells. Now, if you have young human progenitor cells, that are stem cells, for example, that make every cell in your body, well, their secretome is sort of, well, not sort of, it's irrelevant. It's just simply irrelevant to immune modulation. Or if you're trying to fix the heart, it's irrelevant to cardiomyocytes. 
If you want to fix the heart, you need heart precursors, cardiomyocyte progenitors, cardiomyocytes in their young stages that secrete a tissue specific, a tissue relevant secretome. So in our case, we are generating a, a milieu, the full natural secretome that contains all of the pro and anti-inflammatory agents and modulatory agents. It is truly a symphony of factors and we don't mess with it. We don't add anything. We don't take anything away. This is all human. It's all natural. It's precisely what you had when you were having more progenitors at the age of 27. We have determined through looking at that secretome that there's nothing bad in it. There's nothing like an inhibitor of tumor suppressors, which would be bad. That would cause tumor growth. This is an immunomodulatory. And any kind of aberrant thing that you have going on in you as a human is mm -hmm. because of that upset of a very complex balance. Cancer, for example, requires a niche that is abnormal. So if you have a proper balanced immune system, you can't generate that niche. So by providing a fully balanced, all natural, physiologically relevant levels of the full secretome set of these young progenitor cells, and then analyzing them and seeing that they are all the pulses and the minuses, the pro and the anti-inflammatories in a perfect balance, just like you have in your bloodstream. We're just giving you more of those in order to balance your immune system. So, um, so how, how do you isolate the, the secret? And presumably, you you have to grow the cells in a bioreactor. Um, do you have to stimulate the production of the secret? Do they just release it naturally? All young cells will produce a secret home naturally. Every single young cell of all mammalians, okay. they yeah. So certainly, every human tissue in your body, as it's developing at different times and other areas of your body, generally they produce a secretome that cause their neighbors to grow into the mature tissue. And our laboratories, my labs, and the, the folks that work for me over the years, we were the first in the world to take human stem cells and make them into a high purity population. Mm -hmm. So we started out by making human stem cells into a very particular type of spinal cord cell. Now, this was quite a while ago in my 20s <laughs> and um, when I first started at the University of California at Irvine and um, we basically I, I, I procured human stem cells and was the first in the world actually to procure anything for the central nervous system I'm a neuroscientist and I, I developed with my team a, a method of coaxing those cells with liquids and the physical substrates on which they grow by changing those parameters pushing them to become gently, it almost 100% pure. I believe the number was 99.6% pure of a particular spinal cord cell type called an oligodendrocyte, which we transplanted into rodents and then in humans and showed that it stopped the cavity formation after spinal cord injury, it repaired, and it actually restored full use of arms, motor and sensory to full quadriplegics, a really, very meaningful uh, treatment. Learned a lot from that treatment and that spinal cord injury is a small market indication. So even though we took that thing right through clinical trials into phase one and begun phase two efficacy testing, mm -hmm. there was no big pharma, no large corporations that would get involved because spinal cord injury is a small market, about 18,000 people a year in the United States, roughly, depends on how you classify but um, it's too small for big pharma. It doesn't make a billion dollar annual market or more. So it was hard to develop in its later, more expensive stages of clinical trials. Where at Immunis, what we've done is applied similar technologies where we first purify the cell population, not into, of course, a spinal cord cell type called an oligodendrocyte, which would secrete oligodendrocyte specific secretome, but rather, to a different cell population, a nice young cell population that secretes the immune system secretome. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my past, we have done liver, heart, motor neurons, um, cardiomyocytes, human skin precursors. 
for this particular story at Immunus, we've done something that's never been done before. We generated a high purity cell population, about 99.6, 99.8% pure population that secretes every factor relevant to immune system development and health. And that's our product. So going back to, to, to the FDA and, and um, that recently uh, allowed the use of secretums, um, um, we know that, that Immunis recently began a trial to, to yes. treat muscle, muscle atrophy. Um, can, can you please uh, tell us about, uh, about this indication and, and the process of, of working with the FDA to, to get to this point? Yeah, I'd love to. You know, I'm just delighted. We are so <laughs> excited to be in humans now. It's it's just, uh, it's a wonderful thing to be able to help people. And uh, it's one thing, helping a mouse. It's another thing entirely, helping a human. And uh, I can't tell you how overjoyed we are to have worked successfully with the FDA to have this approval. Um, working with the FDA is expensive and it is slow. However, if you look back, on all drugs, those that go through the FDA or those that do not in any country, you will see that the drugs that go through the FDA have greater value and therefore they are picked up and funded by venture capital organizations and then big pharma and partners. They are the ones that go public or maybe a private equity firm helps them out. But the, the point being, they are validated they're validated because they are regulated by a body. And yes, it takes more money and some time to do that, but it has been proven that those drugs that go through a regulatory body like the FDA reach the greater number of people faster. And that's because of the irrefutable evidence that one has with the scrutiny of the FDA. So it's tricky, it's expensive, it's hard. One might be tempted to go out and say, you know, I'm going to go to a country that isn't regulated, where this drug is not regulated, and just start shooting up humans and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But even if you have the best drug in the world, a complete blockbuster with no side effects and all the efficacy you could ever dream of, I tell you, another drug going through the FDA will reach the greater number of people the fastest. And that's because it accrues validation and value, monetary value. So I can't underscore that enough. It's difficult, but that, all that means is that you've got to get experts. Everything in the world is difficult. We live in a very, very complex, complex society, very, very sophisticated, where people are highly educated and or highly specialized. And really what you have to do is just just take that on. You must go through the FDA for these drugs for the safety of humans, first and foremost. But also, you know, it's a fiduciary responsibility that you have to all of your investors to do this the right way. So we applied to the United States FDA after a great deal of work. We iteratively went back and forth with the FDA saying, what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? And they provide excellent counsel. You could complain and whine that it takes months for them to get back and then reply, et cetera. But all that means is that you have to have your act together and start early, ask the right questions. We convened groups of experts looking at various indications. For the immunist product, this was particularly difficult because an immunomodulatory affects every immune disorder Mm -hmm. but it also affects every single manifestation of normal aging. So when you age, you have an accumulation of inflammation in your brain that causes a whole bunch of brain diseases. Almost everyone known to you is mm -hmm. inflammatory, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. You, with the, when you age, you also have blood vessel changes, your elastic plastic tubes and you become rigid steel and that results in high blood pressure and hemorrhagic stroke and heart attacks your muscles again every human their muscles also shrink it's called sarcopenia when you're older but it's basically muscle wasting everybody has it every single person that ages has muscle wasting 
the downstream effects of muscle wasting are extreme. You're having less blood flow because your muscles are tiny or not pumping as much. You're not doing as much exercise. That causes stagnation and buildup of things in your blood vessels that can cause occlusive blockage of the flow, occlusive strokes, et cetera. They release, muscles release things that cause brain health. You start exercising less, it has a catastrophic effect on your brain. So there's all kinds of these downstream effects. Even diabetes is, a, is an immune thing. Your metabolism is partly immune. Hair loss is some immune system. Your skin thinning. It's extraordinary how many things are affected by one's immune system. So picking an indication was tough. We originally thought, let's go into immobilization injuries, like an athlete who has a cast on their arm, mm -hmm. and propose that to the FDA. And the FDA said, you know, no, okay. you, should, you should consider the risk benefit. We don't want to administer a drug to a group of humans that's going to recover anyways. Because when you get a cast off, your arm does recover with exercise, which you can do, and uh, time, which you've got. And they usually happen in the younger populations that... Generally speaking, they're out of their sport for a while, but then they come back. So the risk benefit just isn't there. A brand new drug, never before tested in humans. Do you want to test it on a population that's completely normal and will get normal? And the FDA says no. So, you know, we then went to look at hip replacements because if you need a hip replacement, you are immobilized. So, ah, there's one. We could keep muscle mass up while we are, you know, waiting for the patient to get a hip replacement. We were all excited about that. FDA loved it. But then we went out to orthopedic doctors that do these types of things. And they said, well, wait a minute. After they said, oh, love it. Yes, we need muscle. We need muscle to be kept strong in these patients before and after we do surgeries. But hmm, we are putting in synthetic materials like metal and uh, coatings on the metal in to replace these, these hips and various surgeries and we don't want to be messing with the immune system while we're putting metal in someone um, and so we thought ah oh, you know that makes a lot of sense that's a doctor's perspective and it was correct my point being here that one has to use focus groups of experts in concert with the experts at the fda and in concert with the biology of the drug that you are developing and look at it from multiple angles and you look, you look, you look, you leave no stone unturned until you find an indication that has the least possible complications for the human receiving this new drug. So what we settled on was knee osteoarthritis. Now we're not treating knee osteoarthritis. We're actually treating muscle atrophy using a patient that is suffering from knee osteoarthritis, several of them, of course. So if you have a muscle wasting, it is for certain a result of one of three things, aging, immobilization, or disease. Knee osteoarthritis has all of those things. And before a surgeon wants to get in there, perhaps move things around, treat a little bit on the knee, these patients are immobilized. They're older. People with knee osteoarthritis are generally older. So they are starting to have muscle atrophy because of aging. Mm -hmm. And then that is exacerbated by the disease and the immobilization of knee osteoarthritis, resulting in a situation where the thigh will shrink in many cases, one third of the volume in a month. That's a phenomenal rate of muscle atrophy. And what that does for human clinical testing is it means that we give our drug for only a very short period of time to people. And when you're doing that for the first time in the world, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be safe with the human. So a short duration administration is better than a long duration administration, just in case there was a problem with the drug and or the surgeries or whatever associated with it. So we chose knee osteoarthritis in one for one reason of being the short duration of the drug application. And then secondly, we can see the signal. We can see the effect so quickly. So we get into humans, we um, administer this product and we can tell within a month if they are, their muscle atrophy is getting less, if it's less than uh, what it normally would be without the drug. We also know that there are 
FDA approved outcome measures for muscle strength and growth and volume. So that's good. So we can use FDA approved measures to see if this works. It also poses a tremendous benefit with almost zero risk to the patient. I say almost zero risk because it is a new drug that hasn't been used in humans. And I can talk about the safety that we've done prior to assure that it'll be safe, but it is a risk. It's a first in humans are always a risk. So um, keeping it short duration, seeing tremendous benefit with almost no chance of risk, that's the patient you want. So muscle atrophy is known to exacerbate the deleterious effects of knee osteoarthritis. Keeping the muscle mass up is known to prevent many of the downstream effects of knee osteoarthritis, the, the decline in function. And of course, a functioning leg allows you to walk, move, run, keep your heart rate up, keep those growth factors going to your brain and your body to keep the rest of you healthy. And then it also helps in this matrix of making a decision on which indication. It helps that there is no competition in muscle atrophy. You know, you can use testosterone, but boy, that's not even targeted at muscle. That's, a you know, any effect on muscle, which is highly equivocal and argued in the literature, is actually a side effect of other hormonal changes that happen with testosterone use. Not the greatest thing for muscle atrophy for certain. And then there's exercise. Um, but again, if you're immobilized, can't exercise. So we have a situation in muscle atrophy where there is no competition. We have a situation in sarcopenia where there is no competition. There are no approved drugs. And we have a situation in aging where there are no drugs approved for aging. Now, we are doing all three of those things in the same human population. They are older, they are immobilized with the disease and muscle atrophy. So we, the labeling that we get, the claims that we get out of a successful trial are tremendous. So I'd be remiss if I didn't just talk quickly about the safety that we've done prior, because I did mention safety in this human trial. Yeah, yeah. So approved by the FDA to run a phase one, two, a, and I'm very proud of uh, my team because this first test in humans is testing not only safety, like you usually do in your first in human tests, but also nine measures of efficacy. That is tremendously informative and it is strategic. So if you are an entrepreneur developing a drug, please take note of that. If you can get into humans, that's phenomenal. The value accretion for your drug product, the benefit you can do to humans is tremendous because now you're in human testing and application. But if you can couple the safety test, the first, which is typical for first in human, with a 2A component, which is efficacy, and then layer on the efficacy measures, don't do one or two, do three or four or five, or in our case, nine, so that at the end of that trial, we are tremendously informed about safety and efficacy and we are informed about which particular measure of efficacy shows the best signal to ensure that our subsequent clinical trials, which become more costly, are de-risked. So prior to doing this, of course, we had to show safety in um, animal models. So we handed this out to a third party, good um, laboratory practice certified FDA compliant group. And the FDA mandates that one does this. We can't control the experiment. We can't dose the mice. We just give the drug and help them outline the experiments, but they do them. So it's completely third party, double blinded. And we showed in those animals that there was no adverse events in any tissue, in any liquid in the body. And then we also tried this on human muscle in a dish and showed that there was no deleterious effects. We've done that in blood in a dish and shown no deleterious effects. So we've done everything we can, including human tissues, to show that this does not harm humans. But there's nothing like uh, doing this in a human to make sure that uh, the full human doesn't have any side effects. So that's what we're doing now. And we're just overjoyed. We're working at the University of California at Irvine's medical center called UCI Health, okay. one, of the, one of the top uh, hospitals in the world. So to, to summarize for other um, founders in biotech, you need to get a, um, a clinically relevant problem. You need a, a short duration of the trial. And then you need to define concrete, multiple concrete uh, outcomes of efficacy. Uh, well said, yeah. 
yeah, yeah. That's that, that's gold. So so um so com compared to to um you're going back to the FDA um compared to to other uh, like um uh cell therapies. Well, this is not cell therapy, but but compared to cell therapies or to to recombinant proteins, uh, yeah. are secretums do, do secretums face different regulatory bar barriers compared to these ther therapies that are already a bit um, uh, popular or or like uh, more understood? Yeah, very good. Yeah, like the a secretome is a different drug category than recombinant proteins, and it's also both of those are a different drug category than cellular therapies. Mm -hmm. So I have run cellular therapy um, work my entire career. And in this case with immunists, we start with the cells. We start with a stem cell, then we make it into a young precursor, and then we collect the secretome of the tissue specific immune precursor secretome. But we're using cells in the production. Mm -hmm. We're not putting them in a human. Now, tra cell transplantation into a human brings up one great, great problem of rejection. So they've got to be your cells. Now that raises cost of goods and makes it near impossible to do. So, you know, if you take someone else's cells and put them in you, you'll reject them. And so you could be causing, and you probably will be causing a great deal of harm. There are some ways to get around this with massive and long doses of immunosuppression, which have their own problems or putting the cells in at a very particular time when their when their rejection molecules these major histocompatibility complexes are low so that the they don't cause a rejection and allow time for the human receiving them to become tolerant but it is a tricky difficult business so rejection is one issue but the other issue that is far greater for the cellular therapy field is one of um, batch to batch variability which equals cost of goods, which equals regulatory barrier. So let me back that up. Mm -hmm. So batch to batch variability. Human cells are as different in a dish as every human is from another. They are sensitive to the environment and they mature or they stay young. They differentiate to one thing or another thing completely, depending on the environment. Everything from temperature to the food that they're given to their own memory of what they were, the genetic expression and the methylation of the genetics limit what they can become. So when you are growing cells in a dish, they've, it's like they've got their own mind. They really behave differently. So batch to batch variability is the greatest problem in cellular manufacturing, because as you scale up, now you've changed the conditions. They're floating in a cubic meter of liquid rather than a cubic millimeter of liquid, and they have all of this food around them. They're moving faster, perhaps encountering more molecules, even though the liquid is the same, just the volume effect has created a difference. That's just one of a hundred examples I could run through, but I won't for time. It's batch to batch variability is so difficult because the cells like to do what they want to do. And then that means that you may have to do 20 batches in order to get one that conforms to your batch release criteria, a set of markers, a set of phenotypic, that means behavioral uh, criteria that you and your company have agreed with, with the FDA. We're only allowed to transplant these cells into humans if they conform to some particular specifications. And it's, I have actually seen clinical work where only one in 20 batches conforms so you still have to make the other 19 and then throw them away. That makes for a tremendously high cost of goods. And then in addition to that, there are other manufacturing normalizers in order to try to get them to fit to conformity. And there are extra steps to try to get a batch to release. So all of these things add to cost. And because the, you're having to go through so much more trouble, they also add to the regulatory burden. So when the FDA looks at that, they say, oh, no, 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 you need to watch out for this. You need to watch out for that. You need to watch out for this and that. And that's all called in-process controls, which make your manufacturing extremely cumbersome and even more costly. So most cell transplantations are not um, cost-effective and have a too high of a regulatory bar. Even if they come from you, 
when you take them out of the body, if they divide once, <laughs> it is non-compliant with the FDA to put them back in again. The FDA does allow minimally manipulated cells to come out and right back into you again without being monitored by the FDA. But this is being exploited by the stem cell field in a terrible manner. And, you know, just I believe it was last year, over 300 cease and desist letters were given out by the FDA for cellular therapy companies that said, whoa, we're not manipulating the cells. We're just taking out, putting back in again. But they're not. They are manipulating them. They are growing them in a different environment. They're treating them with different liquids that causes different genes and proteins to be expressed. By the time they're back into you, they are different cells. So they're skirting the regulations of the FDA. So costly, high regulatory bar, very difficult to scale cellular therapies. And then the recombinant proteins, great idea, phenomenal technology, but very expensive. So for example, in um, the immunist product, we have a few hundred factors. So we would have to actually make all of them in recombinant proteins, which would have a cost of goods of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, we don't want to do that. At Immunist, what we want to do is make a product that everyone can afford and very, very inexpensive so that even people of, you know, less fortunate socioeconomic uh, situations can actually get these drugs and stave off disease. So, so secretums uh, offer advantages in terms of, um, of price, uh, characterization, and I guess the standardization of, of, of the product uh, compared to, to, to cell therapy. And, and Yeah, it's very true. It's hard to get a secretome consistent because it means that you have to have a starting cell population consistent. But at Immunist, we are a team of scientists that have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, several of my staff have worked for me for 22 years in the various companies that uh, I have founded and started and sold. And that has resulted in uh, just a tremendously skilled team with a lot of tricks, tools, know-how for manipulating human cells and growing them in a way that is consistent. So we can grow these young precursors and dishes by the billions in homogeneity. No cell is different. And what they secrete is therefore the same. And so we do this with multiple batches, as is demanded by the FDA before you move into humans, and show that we have extremely little variation in the molecules of uh, one versus another versus another versus another batch to batch. They don't vary. They stay in their relative concentrations and importantly, physiologically relevant con concentrations. It's highly unlikely that these things can cause harm because you're full of them. And we're not giving you any more than you had when you're 27. And in fact, secretomes being a new drug, we haven't seen adverse events in the trials that have been run thus far. So, so uh, are, are there any other um, secretome-based therapies on the market? Or are you... Finding... Yeah, there's, there's actually a few. Uh, most of them are MSCs, mesenchymal stromal stem cells. So these are bone marrow extracts and things like that. Uh, fat uh, extracts, etc. cetera. Um, almost all of them are actually transplanting the cells, but mm. the benefit is known to be by the secretome because the transplanted cells die. This is something that the consumer population is largely unaware of. They think, for example, a stem cell transplantation is going to fill you full of young stem cells that are going to become the tissue that was lost. Yeah. That is certainly untrue. What they do is die. But before they die, they secrete factors because they're young. If they're young, some groups are not putting young cells in and they really just don't do anything. Others are putting in a younger cell population mixed with older. So you have death factors and um, you know free oxygen radicals and things like that that cause harm. It's very, very important that you use caution when looking at the stem cell sector. I've been in it my entire career and where you know, 15 years ago when it all started, maybe 99 out of 100 stem cell techniques were snake oil. We're still down to uh, about not seven, eight, nine out of 10 are snake oil. So it's a tricky field. It's certainly real, but one has to wade through a lot of fantasy and nonsense to get to the real goods. So, um, uh, after um, immunis is uh, 
pursues the 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 muscle atrophy um, indication. Um, what would be your next in the uh, next in line if you, if you can talk a little bit about? Sure. That? Yeah, I'm really excited about that. We've designed this phase one two A and picked an indication for the phase one two A clinical trial that allows us to do multiple things. So again, strategy. Um, you want to pick a your first in human indication that will then branch out. So in knee osteoarthritis, for example, uh, after we run a successful phase one, two A, we could go into knee osteoarthritis. So we could actually take a label for knee osteoarthritis and move forward with a phase two, phase three, BLA commercial approval in knee osteoarthritis. But likewise, we could also go forward with any manifestation of muscle atrophy pure sarcopenia, which is just simply muscle atrophy in the aged, no other problems, just muscle atrophy in the aged. We could move forward with muscle atrophy as a result of immobilization. Now the FDA would allow the application of this drug to people with casts because we'll have already shown that it is safe and efficacious in humans. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're worried about. So now the risk benefit is zero risk and only upside. So they would allow it at that population. We could move into arterial stiffness because the wall of an artery is muscle. That is the mechanism of action. So very small logical leap to move forward and to try to prevent arterial stiffness. So we are looking now, we are actually calling focus groups now. We expect to be finished this phase one to a clinical trial quite soon. We're, it's only a three month study in full duration and we've just started. So we expect to finish this thing quite quickly. And um, of course, we've got to watch the patients for a period of time afterwards, but we'll still have our safety and efficacy measures and we can move on to phase two. So it's interesting, the speed of the trials is fantastic for value accretion. It's fantastic for the ability, first and foremost, to help patients. It's great for a company, it's great for the pace, it's great for investors because of the value accretion, but it's hard on an operational level because at Immunis, we've got a, we're just starting a phase one and we're writing our phase two. <laughs> we're having focus groups for our second phase two. What are we going to get into after this? So we do expect to continue forward with knee osteoarthritis. It's a massive market. There's a huge unmet medical need and the patients are, in my view, suffering unnecessarily the poor outcomes of the um, typical standard of care manipulations now for knee osteoarthritis and all the osteopathic surgeons, the osteopeds, they're, they're all telling us that it's muscle, it's muscle, it's muscle, it's muscle. So if we can actually increase the muscle density and function, decreasing muscular atrophy in these patient populations, their prognosis after uh, their KOA standard of care is orders of magnitude larger. So we will continue on that, but we're actually just looking now at what we're going to do for a second indication. And that's fun because now that we've proven the safety, we can actually go into any manifestation of human aging and immune decline. Yeah, that, 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 that sounds fantastic. And, um, and maybe to, to wrap up, as, aside from, um, from secretums or stem cell products, are you excited uh, about um, any other um, rejuvenation treatments? Yeah, you know, I, I really am. I think that um, there's a, a lot coming. Like I am particularly focused on the secretome world right now because of a couple things. One, the safety profile is impeccable. These are naturally occurring secretomes. You have in you, you just have fewer of those things with age when you have, because you have fewer progenitors. So it just makes a lot of sense. Now that secretomes are a new drug category, we really, the world has opened up in therapeutics. The things that we can do with these things, these secretomes are just innumerable. Like they, there's just so many indications, so many benefits with this brand new drug category. We also see big pharma getting in here. So Biogen, Novartis, Eli Lilly have all jumped in to secretome space. So that's good to see. That's a that's a basically a validation of the market and the drug ability of the product style. And to see that big pharma validation of secretomes in concept 
um, not in product yet, because it's still early days, but in concept, they feel that they can scale that and sell it. That's very good. Big Pharma is not all bad. You know, there's a lot of uh, negative on Big Pharma. I don't really share that because every drug you've ever taken goes through Big Pharma. And um, they, they do cost because there's so many failures out there. So I'm not going to really refute or, you know, support uh, these Big Pharma critiques. But I tell you, knowing that Big Pharma has analyzed this sector and seen it to be exciting is a great validation for investors and entrepreneurs for the sector. So I'm really looking at these naturally um, uh, secreted products because I believe it is a far, far superior technology to cellular transplantation. And uh, it uh, it sounds like it, and uh, it, it, it uh, in terms of standardization cost, it's uh, it's, 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 it's an exciting field. It's like you know I've always had a philosophy in all the drugs that I've developed, and um, they have been that that philosophy is to mess as little as you can with the human condition. So I'm a stem cell scientist. You have cells that are usually inside of the body in this beautiful developmental nurturing environment of the beautiful, majestic human body, which we don't understand. You take those cells out of that beautifully orchestrated symphony within a naturally growing human, you put them in a dish, I think I'm pretty good. I think my team's pretty good. Probably the best in the world in this sector, but we are terrible compared to the human body. We we don't hold a candle to that flame. The the majesty of the human body is just incomprehensible even to those individuals who study it tremendously. So we have to accept that the body does it a lot better than we do. So my philosophy with the development of stem cell technologies that I've pursued my whole career is to mess with it as little as possible. We let the right cells secrete the right, right stuff. And that's the trick. We're not trying to put a square peg in a round hole here. We've got the right cell population. They are secreting what they secrete. And then we're putting it right back into the patient. Minimal, minimal work outside of the body trying to keep trying to keep that majesty of the human body intact and, and to wrap up with, with a bit uh, with, with some comments about aging um, I think it's, it's fantastic that that, 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 um, that this technology came from from an understanding about the processes of, um, of aging how how, um, how how we can uh, go back to um, to how the body works at a younger state. Correct. It's yeah. Uh... yeah. It is really, you know, I I feel so fortunate to have been a stem cell scientist. I originally got stem cells as a tool in a toolbox. <laughs> there were wonderful, wonderful cells, and I do all kinds of things: electron microscopy and molecular biology and histopathology. I'm a pathologist. I'm a neuroscientist. As a as an exploratory scientist, all these things are tools, but stem cells they are one special tool. They are a microcosm of the macrocosm that is the human. They are models of human. They're models of human disease. They're models of human interaction. They're models of both disease, but also health and repair. And by watching those cells, by studying those cells, our entire careers at, at Immunist, we're able to take advantage of, of some of the known norms, the things that we're certain of and produce a product that is truly an immunomodulatory and therefore truly applicable to every manifestation of aging. That, uh, that, that's great. Um, uh, Hans, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to, to talk with me. And, uh, and I'm sure that this uh, can help other um, entrepreneurs in the field and, and uh, perhaps other investors too. Um, well, thank you, Jose, and thanks to Quadroscope for the, the support that they've had for our community and Immunis. And I do welcome anyone with uh, questions, queries, comments, challenges. Please bring it on. It's uh, Science is one where we stand on the shoulders of those that come before us and hold hands with everyone around us. <laughs> so please feel free to reach out. That's it. Um, well, um, 
Uh, thank you for listening and um, and goodbye. Thank you.